cross-reference. How many of you have a cross-reference Bible and have Jude 23 in it as a cross-reference? One, two, two of you. All right. Jude chapter uh, 1, there's one chapter in verse 23. Now watch this thing on the garments. Another saved with fear, fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. There's a strange thing. What is this thing that the garments spotted by the flesh? Now, it evidently, if you take, compare that with Revelation chapter 16, take your Bible and turn to Revelation 16, and then compare all three verses together, maybe you can come up with something. Revelation chapter 16, and look at verse 2. Uh, Revelation 16, 2. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon men which had the mark of the beast. So something happened to those people that took the mark of the beast, some kind of sore fell on them. Some kind of sore fell on them. And then it says in Jude, they're spotted by the flesh. The garments are spotted by the flesh. Now with that in mind, look back at Revelation chapter 3. And uh, let's read verse uh, 4 and 5 again. All right. Not defile their garments. They shall walk with me in white. So they get a, a white robe. They get a white garments. For they are worthy. Now verse 5. He that overcometh. There's that tribulation thing which you saw of all seven churches happen to overcome. What's he overcoming? He's overcoming the mark of the beast. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed. Here it is. He's going to get a, a good set of clothes. Clothed with white remnant and will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So here's somebody in the tribulation that does not overcome, takes the mark, and defiles his garments. Now you need to write down some cross-reference. Get some cross-reference. I gave you a few. Let's turn to them again. So it's somebody who takes the mark of the beast. He gets some kind of thing that takes place that defiles his garments as well. His clothing go bad. His clothes go bad. Now, Revelation chapter 16, watch where if he's faithful and he overcomes, the Lord gives him a white robe, give him some clean clothes and has to do with them being worthy. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15. Revelation 16, 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keep, now watch it, and keepeth his garments. Underline that. That's a man in the tribulation then. It keeping his garments. It's like the thing's automatic. As soon as he takes the mark, it defiles his garments too. Keepeth his garments. Least he walk naked and they see his shame. It's like it defiles his garment to the place to where it, he's end up with, it just rots his clothes. It'd be kind of like leprosy. It'd be a lot like leprosy. It'd be a lot like it. Now, the reason why you said leprosy is because that leprosy gets in clothing as well as it can get in a building, it can get in the flesh. It can get in the flesh, and that's where you find leprosy in the Old Testament, in the flesh. But you also find leprosy in a building. You also find leprosy in a piece of clothing, in a piece of clothing. So evidently, that's what that thing is connected with. Now let's get a few more cross-references. Look at uh, Revelation chapter 6, and look at verse 11. Now write down uh, the references, Revelation chapter 6, and verse 11. Let's pick up verse 10. Let's pick up verse 10. Let's pick up verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes, underline it, white robes were given unto every one of them. So here's somebody that's been killed and given a white robe and it was said of them that they should rest yet for a little season until thy fellow servant also their brethren that they should be killed as they should be fulfilled and I behold and he said unto me the sixth seal and lo there are the greater well, so on down through the passage 
but underline it, they get a white robe is given unto them, and then somebody else is going to die just like they died, shall be killed as we should be killed. Evidently, they get their head cut off because they wouldn't take the mark of the beast. They wouldn't take it, so they get their head cut off. All right, then they get a white robe, get a new robe. Now again, take your Bible, turn to Revelation chapter 7, and look at verse 9. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. Here's this clothing, here's this garment, here's this white robe given to tribulation saints. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. And after this I behold and lo a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindred and people and tongue, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, cold, now watch it, with a white robe. With a white robe robe. There it is again. Those are tribulation saints. Tribulation saints. Uh, let's look at, uh, uh, let's read verse, uh, let's skip down and get verse uh, 13. And one of the elders answered and said to me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? There it is again, verse 13. Uh, which cometh life? And he said to me, sir, thou Knowest, and he said to me, These are they which come out of the great tribulation. There it is, underline it. These are they which come out of the great tribulation. They get a white robe. They come through it. They pass it. They didn't take the mark. And have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Tribulation saint. Tribulation saint. All right. <clears throat> Again, look at Revelation chapter 7. Oh, we just give, that's just the one I give you. That, uh, that's the one I just give you. All right, so it has something to do with when they take the mark, they don't overcome, they take the mark, that uh, they get some kind of sore, probably leprosy, probably, probably leprosy, that gets in the clothes and defiles of garments, eats them up. Revelation chapter 3, yes. Could be, that could be that. It could be that, but I would say probably leprosy because when you, you, you leprosy is con so contagious that if you get in and touch anything that's leprosy on it, that's why in the Old Testament he had put his hand over his mouth and say, unclean, unclean. You couldn't touch a leper. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that might be too true. But then if you look at this, look at... Uh, Look at Revelation chapter 13 and go back to Jude chapter 23. Look at Revelation 13 and look at Jude chapter 23 again. And not watch this one particular word here. Uh, Jude chapter 1 verse 23 and it says, Others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments. Now look at that word right there. Spotted, spotted. It has to do with it being spotted of some kind of thing. Now look at Revelation chapter 13 and look at verse 2. Revelation 13, 2. Now this is the Antichrist. When he shows up here in the tribulation, this is the Antichrist, which is the devil incarnate. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 2 now, it's talking about a man. And the beast, that's the man, that's the Antichrist which I saw was like unto a what? Leopard. Now you say, I don't think the leopard spotted. Well, uh, turn to Jeremiah chapter 13. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 13 and see that the leopard is spotted. Jeremiah chapter 13, the leopard is spotted. That's why he said he's likened unto a leopard. When he describes something, wants you to see a man, that's the Antichrist, and describes him to you, he said he's like a he's like a leopard. He's like a leopard. Well, he's spotted. Uh, Jeremiah chapter thirteen, verse twenty three says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Or the leopard his what? Spots. So it has to do has something to do with the leopard spots. That's what it has something to do with. Now I'm not exactly what it is connected with, but it has 
something to do with elaborate spots. All right, now back to Revelation chapter uh, 3 again. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5. And he that overcometh the same shall be clothed with white remnant, and I will not, underline the word not, not blot out his name out of the book of life. Now you want to have some cross-references because you want to have a spiritual application. Now most of your commentaries will make a spiritual application out of the entire Bible. They'll spiritualize the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. They'll spiritualize the whole thing. And that sometimes is disastrous. Now we'll make a spiritual application and you need to know the spiritual application. Take your Bible and turn to John, the Gospel of John and turn to 1 John chapter 4. Now this is a spiritual application of the passage. 1 John, 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. Uh, well, I say, yeah, that's, that's one. There, there's one. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Ye are God, little children, and have, underline the word have, have overcome them because greater is he that in you than he in the world. Okay, look also at chapter 5, chapter 5, look at verse 4 and 5. First John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5, and whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even your faith. Uh, who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? See there, so if you read that verse, you'd say all saved people have automatically overcome because they believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Make it automatic. Follow that? But that's a spiritual application. Now in Revelation chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, now I'm talking doctrinally, it has to do with this verse. Right at the margin of the Bible, Revelation chapter 20, Revelation chapter 20, verse 15. Here's the right connection. If you go back to 1 John, you make spiritual application. But you can do that, but you want to make a doctrinal application to the right verse is Revelation chapter 20. Verse 15 is the correct way to go. You say, how do you know? Look at the verse. Revelation chapter 20, verse 15 says, And whosoever is not found written, where? In the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. So here it said, if he overcomes, his name will not be written out, taken out of the book of life. Over here it says the book of life was there. Whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Why? Because the tribulation saint is not going to the judgment seat of Christ to be judged because it's taken place in heaven. He's not going to the judgment seat of Christ. And the millennial saint is not going to the judgment seat of Christ going over here. That's why the book of life is at the great white throne judgment. It is to say the tribulation saint, his name's in there, so he's not put in hell. The millennial saint, his name's not is in there, so he's not going to hell. That's why the book is there. All right, Revelation chapter 20 and verse uh, 4 says, I mean not 20, Revelation chapter uh, 3, verse 4. Revelation 3, 4 says, uh, if he overcomes, he will not get his name blotted out of the book of life. So also write down Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. Turn to it, which is also the great white throne judgment, where a man uh, comes to that judgment. You say, what's it doing in the middle of of the book of Revelation because in the middle of the book of Revelation there's four separate accounts of the tribulation and he's coming to the end of uh, one of the accounts uh, let's see which account is it he's coming to the end of which one is it he's coming what account the account of what the Antichrist the account of the Antichrist chapter 13 and 14 look at Revelation chapter 13 Verse, no, that's not the one I want, is it? Is it? 13.8, no, that's not it. Well, yeah, that'll go. 13.8 will be, but that's not the one I was wanted. And all that dwell on the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. 
I see Antichrist people. Their name's not written in the book of life. But I want one on the judgment. It's uh, 14, uh, 14, is it 14? Let me find it. Uh, maybe it's 12. Maybe it's chapter 12. It's chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. And pick up uh, verse 17. Revelation 11, 17. So there's going to be the book of life there because the saints are at the white throne judgment. How many have ever heard at the white throne judgment only unsaved people will be there? How many have ever heard it? Only unsaved people will be there. Now, Revelation chapter 11, pick up verse 17. Saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and which uh, was and which, are, and which are to come, because thou hast taken to thee the great power, now underline the last three words in verse 17, and hast reigned. The millennium is over. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged. White throne judgment, that's Revelation chapter 20. And that thou shouldest give rewards unto thy servants, the prophets. There it is. That's a white throne judgment, but you're going to have some servants there. And to the saints, tribulation saints and millennial saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, shall destroy them to destroy the earth, and so on and so on. So that's the great white throne judgment given in the middle of the book of Revelation because it's a separate account. They're separate accounts. All right, back to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 and verse, verse 6. He that hath an ear, let him hear with the Spirit said unto the churches. And to the angel of the church which is in Pergamot write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, and he that hath the key of David. So this is Jesus Christ. This is Jesus Christ here in the passage. So uh, these things saith he that is holy. Jesus Christ is holy. He that is true. Jesus Christ is true. And he that hath the key of David. Now you want to have the right cross reference. And the right cross reference uh, is Isaiah chapter 22. Write down the key, the key of David. Turn, take your Bible and turn to Isaiah chapter 22 and pick up verse 20. I, Isaiah chapter 22, and uh, I'm sure all the, all the cross-reference Bibles will give this cross-reference. Isaiah chapter 22, verse 20. Let's begin at verse 20, it's paragraph mark. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim. So underline the fellow's name. Eliakim. All right. The son of Ahilakim. And I will clothe him with a robe and strengthen him with thy uh, girdle and will commit thy government unto his hand. Now underline in verse 21. Thy government unto his hand. And he shall be a father unto the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And the key, there it is, there's the word, and the key of the house of David. That's Revelation chapter 3, verse uh, 7. The key of David. Uh, the, uh, the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulders. So he, if he's going to run and rule over the house of David. So shall uh, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. And I will fasten him. So online in verse 23, the him goes back to verse 20, Eliakim. So draw a line under the him in verse 23 and draw a line back to Eliakim in verse 20. I will fasten him as a nail, a nail, in a sure place, as a nail in a sure place. And he shall be for a glorious throne. Underline that throne. So the key of David is to rule over the house of David. That's what it is. The key of David is to rule over the house of David. 
All right, uh, and his father's house, and they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, and so on down through the passage. Now, he'll give you another cross-reference. So, Jesus Christ has the keys of death and hell. He also has the key of David. Uh, here's a great cross-reference. Take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. And in Luke chapter 1, let's pick up verse 32. So the key of David is to have the power to rule over the house of David. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 32 says, And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. That's an earthly throne that goes, begins in the millennium and goes into eternity. And he shall reign over the house of uh, Jacob forever. And his kingdom there shall be no end. All right, Revelation chapter 3 now. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7. Then the key of David is uh, Isaiah 22. It's the power to rule over his kingdom. Uh, and he openeth and no man shutteth. He shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I will set before thee, underline this word in verse 8, an open door, an open door. Now, you want to have the right cross-references for an open door because there's, there's several of them and you want to have them. Uh, let's begin with Colossians chapter 4, verse 3, an open door. See what it is in Scripture. Uh, Colossians uh, chapter 3. And uh, pick up uh, verse 3, uh, 4, Colossians 3, 4. Is it 4, 3? 4, 3. 4, 3. Uh, while praying also for us that God would open unto us, and here it is, a door. So you're praying for it. This is what you ought to pray for. Now to pray that God would give you an open door, that God would open it to us. Notice the word in verse 3, praying. Underline it with your pen. Praying, praying. So you want an opportunity to do something, then pray that God gives you that opportunity. Praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of, now watch it, utterance. That's an opportunity to witness to somebody, to Speak, there it is again. So it's an opportunity to put the Word of God out. It's an opportunity to witness to somebody. It's an opportunity to put out a track. Utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. All right, now uh, get another cross-reference, uh, 2 Corinthians 2.12. Turn to it, 2 Corinthians 2.12. Here's an opportunity to so pray for it. Pray that God give you a chance, give you a opportunity. Second uh, uh, Corinthians two twelve, and it says Second Corinthians two twelve says, furthermore, when I come to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened unto me of the Lord. So uh, underline to preach Christ's gospel. If you want to get a chance to preach the gospel to somebody, then you pray for it and underline it. A door was opened. So God's guiding in your life is like what? God, when God guides you somewhere, what does he do? He opens a door. Now write this down. Don't knock the door down. Don't open the door yourself. Don't open the door yourself. You say, what's that? We force our way into something, we force it to and say, well, it's God's will. No, you did what you wanted to do. An open door is an opportunity that comes and you're, you're praying, you're saying, oh, Lord, give me a chance, give me an opportunity, and blam, there it is. The Lord opens the door. The Lord opens the door. And uh, you pray, say, I do it this way. I say, Lord, give me a chance to preach. Give me a place to preach. Give me an opportunity to preach to somebody. And then the Lord open up a door and I'll get a chance to just preach to it. <laughs> Some guy will ask me, like, like just the other day, a fellow said to me, what do you think about the Mormon church? <laughs> I thought, man, I've got a thousand things to do, but I can't leave this one. 
and I got sidetracked for quite a while. <laughs> what do you think about the Mormon church? Well, I, there's a lot I think about. <laughs> but you say it's an opportunity. Yeah, yeah, man, you ask a Baptist preacher what he thinks of the Mormon church. <laughs> All right, uh, again, uh, write down, you should have Acts 14, 27, Acts 14, 27, and 1 Corinthians 16, 9. It's an open door. It's a chance for you to do something. So when you want a God to do something with you and guide you and direct you and, and bring your life a certain way, say, Lord, give me an open door. Then you're looking and you're waiting and all of a sudden you, you like a door being open. You say, boy, this is what the Lord wants me to do. Blam! Go through the door while it's open. Don't dilly rally and have the door shut because you wouldn't go through it. All right, uh, back to Revelation chapter 3 now. Revelation chapter 3 and uh, verse 8. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, and thou hast little strength, and hast kept my word. Underline that. And hast kept my word. This church here, he's bragging on it. In fact, there's nothing he says about this church that's negative. It's all good. It's all good. Kept my word. Now the question is, have you kept God's word? Ask for verses you can keep. All right? And has not denied my name. So evidently, not denied my name. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. Has not denied my name. It's like in the tribulation saint is going to deny if he takes the mark. If he takes the mark, he's going to deny the Lord's name. I look at uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse uh, 22. Matthew 10, 22. Ye shall be hated of all, nation, all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure to the end shall be what? Saved. See that thing? You shall be hated of all uh, men for my name's sake, for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Evidently, when the Antichrist comes and takes folk, makes folks take a mark, they have to say something about the name of Jesus. They have to say something about it. All right. Uh, it might be, it might be that they say he had an unclean spirit. It might be. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not. But do lie. Behold, I will make them come and worship uh, before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Now, underline, which say they are Jews, they say they're Jews, and are not. Now, who does that today? Who today says that they're Jews and they're not Jews? Yeah, a lot of them do. Yeah, there's a whole slug of them. The whole slug of them. Say they're Jews and they're not. Ain't that a wild shot? Okay, if you say you're a Jew and you're not a Jew, you're of the synagogue of Satan. Get that much out of the verse. Get that much out of the verse. You belong to the devil's church. Man, what a wild thing to say. Ho, 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 who's this guy? No, that's what it says. It says you say you're a Jew and you're not a Jew, you're the synagogue of Satan. Now you want to write down some cross-reference. Take your Bible and turn to the book of Romans. In the book of Romans, there's a spiritual Jew and there's a physical Jew. Now here he says, these folks are saying they're Jews, physical Jews. Why? They want to take all the promises that are given to the physical Jew in the Old Testament and the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 7, he gives them the promises of the 144,000 which are all Jews and gives them the seven tribes. You know what Jehovah's Witnesses say the 144,000 are? They say, that's them. Well, they're all Jews. And I say, how do you say you're a Jew then? They say, well, we're Jews. I then take them to this. Take them to Revelation chapter 3, verse 9, and say, yeah, you got the devil's church. Ooh, boy, they'll really flip out. <laughs> Turn to, uh, turn to Romans now and watch this thing on uh, a man saying he's a Jew. All right, turn to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Now, and pick up 
verse, here's the verse that Herbert Dummy Armstrong went off on. He went nuts on the verse and went way out in left field and messed up the whole thing totally. And this is the verse the Jehovah's Witnesses used to mess up, think they're Jews. And all the rest of them, when they say they're Jews, this is the verse they use. Uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 29. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. The circumcision is that of the heart and in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of man but of God. Now look what it said. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. Now, right in the margin of your Bible, he is a spiritual Jew, not a physical Jew. When it says, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, that's talking about a spiritual thing inwardly. Then you can be, say you're a spiritual Jew inside, but you can't say you're a physical Jew. You're not a physical Jew. Now, so circle the word Jew there in verse 29. Now look at chapter 3, verse 1. What advantage then hath the Jew? There's your physical Jew in 3.1. What advantage then hath the Jew? So the first one's a spiritual one, and the second one is a physical Jew. So they're both. You're not a physical Jew, but you are a spiritual Jew. See that thing? So when you go to Galatians chapter 3, take your Bible and turn to Galatians chapter 3, it says you're a Jew again. But that's spiritual. That's not literal. That's, you're not a literal Jew. You're a spiritual Jew only. Turn to Galatians and Galatians chapter 3 and pick up verse 27. That's how these guys all got messed up. They got these two verses. They went to Romans chapter 2 verse 29 and then compared it to uh, Galatians chapter 3. Now watch this thing on the Jew again. All right, verse 28. Uh, let's, get, uh, let's get 29. Let's get 29. That's better. Let's get 29. Let's skip 28. We'll come back to it in a minute. Let's get 29. Because that's how they do. They don't give you the verse in front of it. <laughs> they give you 29 to mess you up. They don't give you 28. 29 says, And if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed, and heirs, here's the thing that they was after, heirs according to the promise. They want all those promises that were given to the Jew to be to them. And you can't do that. You're a spiritual Jew, but you don't get all that inheritance that was given to the Jewish nation. The Jewish nation gets the earth as an inheritance. Not the spiritual Jew. You say, how do you know that's spiritual? You are Christ and you're Abraham's seed. Look at verse 28 right in front of it. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither what? Male nor female. Folks, that's spiritual. And if you think that's literally, you're out of your mind. You see that thing? That's spiritual. All right, back to Revelation chapter 3. So somebody in the tribulation are saying they're Jews and they're not Jews. They're lying. They're the synagogue of the devil. They ain't Jews, but they're saying they are. Now, why would a person want to say they're a Jew? They're, yeah, get in the chosen people, get in there, and then when the Jews get ready to do something, there's a bunch of folks in them that are really not Jews that mess up everything up. And they're not really Jews, but they're in a bunch of all these Jews right here and mess everything up. They ain't Jews. But they'll put a, a cog in the wheel because they say they are when they aren't. All right, back to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. All right, uh, verse 10. Because thou hast kept my word. There it is again, has kept the word. It's my word. If you draw a line under verse 10, have kept the word, draw a line back up to kept my word. Go right straight back up to verse 8. Kept my word has kept the word of my patience and also keep thee from the hour of temptation. An hour of temptation. Now, most of your commentaries say that's, this is applied to the church age and it's keeping the church age saint from going into the tribulation, which is true. That's true. The, the church age saint does not go into the tribulation. He's raptured out before the tribulation. 
and you could use this verse but uh, I think the verse aims at somebody in the tribulation where it says our H-O-U-R I think it's an hour I think some kind of hour probably aiming at the advent but they all your commentaries all your cross references give it to being in the church age and therefore the church is not going to go into the tribulation which shall come unto all the earth to try them that dwell on the earth behold I come quickly so it must be the advent he's talking about underline in verse 11 behold I come quickly I come quickly he's saying the advent it's almost over right here coming back why if it's way back here did he come quickly way back here folks 2,000 years he didn't come quick right here in the tribulation when he says I come quickly boy he come quickly right there boy he returns I mean the whole thing don't last very long all right uh, uh, hold that fast which thou hast that no man take thy crown underline that that no man take thy crown uh, I think you have in your notes it's other people that mess you up it's other people that mess you up and ain't that the truth you get a crown now how many crowns can you receive at the judgment seat of Christ five of them five of them now here it's probably aimed at a tribulation saint losing his crown that no man take thy crown and he'd say you got a crown you're going to get one go all the way to the end don't give up and quit don't let anybody talk you out and let you take that mark don't lose your crown him that overcometh there it is you got to overcome that mark well I make a pillar in the temple of my God underline a pillar a pillar he's going to be made a pillar in the temple must have something to do with the millennium a millennium temple and he shall go no more out and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God which is New Jerusalem so uh, he gets a name of New Jerusalem written on him we're going to write on him which uh, come down out of heaven so the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven for my God and I will write upon him my new name so he gets the name of God the Father he gets the name of new Jerusalem and he gets a new name of Jesus Christ now write down Revelation 19 12 Revelation 19 12 this fellow going to be written all over <laughs> I guess the Lord likes to write on people he's going to write a new name on you I don't mind if the Lord writes on him do you but that's that technically going to be the tribulation saint revelation 19 12 and his eyes were the flame of fire and on his head were many crowns this is jesus christ and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself that, whatever that name is probably the name he's going to write on that tribulation saint and nobody knew that but he himself i don't know what name that is but whatever name it is that's probably the one he's going to write on him Revelation 3 13 he that hath an ear let him hear with the spirit saith unto the churches he says that to all seven churches and unto the angel of the church of Laodicea and here's the last one now last one is uh, the last the thing is finishing up now if this is the church age which you can apply it to the church age spiritually make good spiritual application and 90% of your commentaries do just that I think Schofield really goes into it. Does Schofield really go into it strong? Most of them give uh, the church age period here. All right, under the angel of church of what? Laodicea. Right. These things saith the Amen. So Jesus Christ is the Amen. The faithful. He's the faithful. And true witness. Jesus Christ is the true witness. Now this thing right here is what messed up the Jehovah's Witnesses and put them in hell it did right here what you're about to read put the Jehovah's Witnesses in hell now look what they did the beginning of the creation of God so they said that Jesus Christ was the beginning of the creation of God they said that Jesus Christ was the first thing that God created he created Jesus Christ as a created God so they teach that Jesus Christ is not God but a created God and they teach it from this verse this is their key verse see how it is see how you can read the thing okay so it's difficult what's wrong with it take the word of and circle it two times write this down the love of God the love of God now folks what is the love of God is that your love for God or God's love for you 
What's the subject? The love of God. What's the subject? It'll go either way. It'll go either way. Now, God can be the subject. That's my love for Him. Or I could be the subject, His love for me. The love of God, folks, you go either way. Romans chapter 8, He loves me. Um, we love Him because He first loved us. The thing will go either way. All right, here you go. Here's one that won't. Now watch this one. Fear of God. Will that go either way? Or is that me fearing God? Or is that God fearing me? That's me fearing God. So it won't go either way. See what I'm saying? So sometimes the word of will go either way. So here, uh, the beginning, it's like Jesus Christ is the beginning. He's the first of anything. He is always, that's why you see Jesus Christ being saying the first and the last. The first and the last, the beginning and the end. He's the one that starts everything. Okay, he's the one that creates everything, begins the whole thing. Now take your Bible and turn to Colossians and you'll see it real clear. Turn to Colossians chapter 1. This is the verse you want to have that makes the whole thing just as clear as it can be. Colossians and the Colossians chapter uh, 1. And uh, let's begin in verse uh, 16. Verse 16. Now the Jehovah's Witness, they swore up and down on Jesus Christ, the created God, and you talk to them one second, and they say, no, he's not God, he's not God, he's not God. If he's not God, how could he die for your sins? That's what you want to put on them. How many of you believe Jesus Christ died for your sins? Where was you, where was you when Jesus died for your sins? You went nowhere. That was almost 2,000 years ago. You mean to tell me if he wasn't God, you didn't even exist? How could he die for your sins? He didn't, you hadn't even committed your sins yet. If he wasn't God, boy, how in the world could he die for your sins? He was God. And he did die for your sins. <laughs> Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him were all things, what? That's by Jesus Christ. He created all all things. Mom, who created the earth in six days then? Folks, Jesus Christ did. When you read Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, it says God did. So, you got it. Let's read the rest of the verse. Uh, all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him and he is now here you go this will straighten out revelation chapter uh, 3 verse 14 and he is what before all things that's revelation chapter 3 verse 14 that Jehovah's witness is messed up he is before all things and by him all things consist now, you want to write down this cross-reference, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, John 1, 1. The Jehovah's Witness hate this verse. They change it in their Bible because it's so clear. John 1, 1, they hate the verse with the passion. John, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning. See that thing? That's why it says over here, the beginning. The beginning of creation of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's what they can't stand. They can't stand the thought of Jesus Christ being God. He's not a God. If he's a God, he's a false God. Because all the gods outside of God are all false. There's only one true God. All right. Uh, now, Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. Revelation 3.15 I know thy works and the Lord does he knows everything I know thy works verse 15 that thou art neither cold nor hot I would that you were cold or hot okay so if this picture is the last church the Laodicean church what's wrong with the Christians in this age they're lukewarm they're lukewarm alright uh, I would that you were cold or hot God is not in between. The Lord says, I don't like you cold. 
I would rather you were cold, I would rather you hot, I don't like you in between. God is, it's either heaven or hell. It's you're saved or lost. It's either black or white. There is no in between with the Lord. He don't like it. All right, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now you want to make sure that you connect that with not yourself. If it's you, what's the Lord going to do? He's going to, you're in his mouth, he's going to spew you out. You're not in his mouth. You're bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. You're part of him. You're, now how many of you know you're part of him? Say amen. You're bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. You're not part of his mouth. Because thou sayest, now you can apply this, because thou sayest, I'm rich. Boy, this church is rich, boy, in America at least. <laughs> and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Have you ever caught yourself saying, Lord, I don't need anything? <laughs> well, you better be real careful. Knowest not. A fellow might need something, might, might need something he don't know he needs it. Know us not that thou art wretched, and call thee, I call us thee to buy, underline that word, buy of me gold tried in the fire. Now if you're going to apply it spiritually, turn to this verse, 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, and look at the application. And it'll encourage you when you stop to think about it. 1 Peter chapter 1. And uh, look at verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse uh, 7. Now notice it says, But the trial of your faith, being much more precious than in gold that perishes, though it be tried in fire, might be found unto praise, that's God praising you, and honor, God honoring you, and glory, God giving you glory, at the appearing, that's going to be the judgment seat of Christ, at the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. You ought to keep your eye on him coming back, because he's going to come back. All right, so the trying of your faith. Now there's some things that try your faith, brother. What are some things that try your faith? Poverty. Write it down. Money problems will try your faith. You know what the Lord will do? The Lord will give you money problems just to try your faith. See what you're made of. See if you come out in like, like gold. So when uh, the bills are not paid, say, Okay, Lord, I know you're trying my faith. I'm going to keep on doing right. You know what else will try your faith? Sickness will try your faith. When you get sick, you want to say, okay, Lord, uh, I'm, uh, you're just trying my faith. I want to keep on doing right and, and not get mad and frustrated. Uh, a lot of things will try your faith, boy. Somebody that really loves you, forsaking you, will try your faith. There's some things in life that will try your faith. There's a lot of them that will try your faith. Come forth as gold. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. And uh, verse uh, 3, I count thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. And white remnant, that goes back to verse 4, there's that white remnant. There's them white robes. That thou mayest be clothed, there it is, that goes back to verse 4, somebody may not be clothed. And that the shame of my nakedness, there it is again. Now I heard a guy down there in... Uh, and Brother D'Amato's church get up and preach that a Christian would be naked at the judgment seat of Christ. <laughs> well, you ought to see his congregation. And this guy was visiting. And there's a visiting preacher. It wasn't even his church. And Brother D'Amato's church was sitting out there and all his people. And the preacher got up and started preaching this verse, the same but night nakedness, and went on a whole bunch of cross reference. And he put the whole bunch of folks at the judgment seat of Christ all naked. Well, you ought to see them folks. Wait, boy, I mean, yeah, I thought to myself, wow, what a thing to preach in another guy's church. <laughs> you can preach that in your own church, but be careful what you preach in somebody else's church. <laughs> and he did it. He went out, but boy, they blackballed him from that point forward. They said, boy, well, what did he do that for? And he shouldn't have done it, not in another fellow's church. Now, I mean, you can do that in your own church. It's your own pockets, your own people that get mad at you. You have to face it, but... 
Man, do that to some other guy's church? I don't know if I'd have done that, boy. But each his own. <laughs> We're clothed in Christ's righteousness. And the tribulation saint, yeah, he's clothed in Christ's righteousness to a certain extent, but he still has his part of, part of his own. Now take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter uh, 19. We'll turn to Revelation chapter 19. And notice about clothing. Notice about clothing. Revelation chapter 19. Look at verse... Uh, okay, verse 8. Revelation chapter 19, verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Now, underline the last part of that verse. For the fine linen is the what? What is it, folks? The righteousness of who? Of the saints? Then clothes has to do with the righteousness of the saints. That's why it said they are worthy. See? And that's how the fellow got on the thing. He said the thing, it's the righteousness of the saints. He took that verse. And by the way, that verse is aimed at the church. That verse is aimed at the church back here. But he said, okay, that's aimed at the church back here and it's the righteousness of the saints. So if a church age saint doesn't have righteousness, he comes up naked at the judgment seat of Christ. Ooh, boy, I mean, the hair just went up on the back of her head when he did that. But the righteousness of the saints is actually going to be the righteousness, I think, of the tribulation saints. I could be wrong, but that's what I think it is. The righteousness of the tribulation saints. And when he takes the mark, he defiles his garment and he shows up naked. And he shows up naked at the great fire throne judgment. Now if you put it back there in the church age, then you got a Christian showing up naked at the judgment seat of Christ who didn't live right. And that's what that preacher did. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? All right, let's find a quitting spot. Revelation chapter 3. Uh, shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Uh, I believe it's tribulation saint. And anoint the eyes with eyes have, eyes have, that thou mayest see. So uh, some way or another, uh, I think it's spiritual eyesight. You need to pray for the Lord's eyes have. Now, I don't know where you're going to find that in the Bible. Anoint your eyes with eyes have. Outside of, Lord, I can't see like I ought to see. Lord, show me. Help me see right. That kind of thing. Spiritual sight. Spiritual sight. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. So if the Lord loves you, he does what to you? How many believe the Lord loves you? Okay, then he'll chasten you. <laughs> Be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open, my, open the door, I will come in to him and he and sup with him and he with uh, him with he with me so it's an individual thing it's an individual thing uh, this verse is used by a lot of soul winners to get somebody saved saying the Lord's standing at the door of your heart and he wants knocking on the door of your heart and he wants to come in will you open up the door of your heart and let Jesus come in that's a spiritual application of the verse and I've even used that myself but it's not the doctrinal application it has something to do with somebody in the tribulation to him that overcometh, there it is again, will I grant to sit with me, now watch it, in my throne, that's his earthly throne, even as, all, even as I also overcome and may sit down with my father on his throne, two different thrones, one is the father's throne and one is the son's throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto the churches. All right, any questions? Any question? Let's begin chapter 4, verse 1. All right, prayer request. Okay. All right, yes. Okay. Pray for him too. Okay, what else? Need to remember in prayer. All right, let's pray for Gloria. 
Okay. Uh, How's your arm doing, Lanny? Good. 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 Gonna be okay. Hopefully. All right. <laughs> there you go. Not too quick. Not too quick. <laughs> Give it some time. <laughs> What else need to remember in prayer? Not forget to pray for the preaching on the street this summer. And don't forget to pray for the jail ministry. And I appreciate you praying for the visitation. Okay, what else need to remember in prayer? All right, let's remember to pray for him, Brother Miller. Let's remember to pray for the kids on the bus. How did a young fellow get saved here uh, Sunday at the road to the bus? Uh, Chuck got a chance to lead him to the Lord. Young fellow sit here. And he wouldn't walk the aisle, but he uh, he wanted to get saved. And evidently, Chuck got a chance to talk to him, pray with him, got saved. That's good. That's the way people are. Huh? Well, good. Good. Let's pray that the Lord will help him grow now and keep the devil away from him. You know, most most Christians that get destroyed get destroyed as as babes, as babes. I want to, it's real easy for children to die when they're young like that. And of course, they don't die spiritually; they go to heaven. Amen. But the devil gets an awful lot of them. You know, they need to become strong and learn how to fight. Tell you what else you need to remember in prayer. All right. Yes. Let's. Remember them in prayer too. I'm sure there's a lot of broken hearts and, and bitterness and a lot of things you can't understand. Crazy world we're in. All right. Okay. Let's remember her in prayer then. Okay, what else do we need to remember in prayer? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd hear our prayers tonight and I pray that you'd answer our prayers according to your will, Father. We just look to you for our prayer meeting tonight. In Jesus' name I pray and for his sake, amen.